Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Disclosure Team channel. Uh, I'm really, really happy uh, to be having this upcoming conversation. Um, I was excited the other day when I woke up to see that congressional hearings were going to be happening next week, as I think a lot of people were. So naturally, I reached out straight away to, to Ralph and said I'd love to chat, and uh, he obliged. So let's jump straight into it, guys. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ralph Blumenthal. Ralph, how are you doing? Hey, great. Nice to, nice to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, I really appreciate it. So, Ralph, let, 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 I'm going to start with a, a question which I'm not sure you, you, you'll be able to answer in depth, but I'd like to know how you get these breaking stories and what the process might be about that. Well, uh, you know, I've been working with Leslie Kane for a long time, and she has uh, particularly good sources um, in and out, out of the government. So we knew about these hearings for quite a while. Um, and uh, we knew they were going to be coming up. We didn't know exactly when. We knew probably in, in May or latter May. And um, our concern was really uh, not to have it leak, because as soon as you start asking questions, you know, you start to disturb the, you roil the waters, and, and, and Washington is a sieve. Um, a lot of people in the congressional committees have friends in the media. So we were concerned that it was like a catch-22. I mean, you, you start to ask questions that you need to do for the reporting, and then you end up, you know, sort of uh, uh, broadcasting your intentions. So it was kind of nerve-wracking for a while because we, we, we knew this. We couldn't really talk about it, and we wanted to protect our exclusive. Um, and luckily, it did hold, and uh, we broke the story last week. Yeah. Now, the hearing in itself is intended to focus on the AOIMSG, the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group. Uh, uh, now, the announcement of this group last year caused some controversy when it was announced because of the timing when the Gillibrand Amendment was actually pushing for a new office to be formed. So a lot of people felt that the Pentagon were attempting to hold keep control of the narrative. Did you did you feel that at all? Well, first of all, that, that uh, acronym doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. <laughs> <It No. doesn't, laughs> uh, maybe they designed it that way to keep it secret because you can't even say it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, well, I think there was a lot of you know, play behind the scenes that we, we don't really know about. But the Pentagon uh, probably wanted to hold on to you know, its primacy of this uh, through the uh, UAP task force. Yeah. Uh, but Gillibrand, I think, uh, was was really uh, very smart to try to broaden it and get uh, allies in Congress uh, to try to get it uh, into a better forum um, and not just be dependent on the Pentagon. So um, I think it's a healthy development. And I think, uh, you know, there's been much too much secrecy about this thing from the very beginning, as you know, decades past. Uh, these are the first hearings in 50, 54 years. <laughs> I mean, that's a long time. And, and the hearings that did happen uh, back then were often misleading. So um, I think these are all positive developments, by the way, that Gillibrand Amendment got through, that there's a new group, that there's a willingness to hold hearings. So um, that's that's all positive. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Uh, now, Andre Carson um, made a comment and he said that the hearing is about examining steps that the Pentagon can take to reduce the stigma surrounding reporting by military pilots and civilian pilots, which I totally agree with. But I feel that it needs to extend beyond pilots into into military branches and, and agencies as well. Do you think that that will change in time? Probably slowly. I mean, again, you got to look at the progress that has been made. And I know it's easy to look ahead and say, gee, we're still, uh, there's still too much ridicule. Um, you know, we still don't know a lot of, we know very little really about what the government has, has compiled. So if you look at that side of the, you know, the empty half of the glass, um, it's, it can be pretty depressing. But if you say, you know, how far we've come. Um, and um, so I think, uh, you know, that's all to the good. And I think um, um, there's still too much ridicule, uh, as you know. I mean, uh, uh, Representative Carson himself said he's expected to take some heat for this hearing, which is ridiculous when you think of it. I mean, heat to examine a phenomenon that has, you know, flabbergasted, uh, flummoxed, uh, confounded our best experts for more than a half a century. I mean, uh, and yet they're still taking heat for that. So he had to say that and indicate, you know, that um, maybe take a little bit of the sting off it. 
But the, the stigma is still there. And a lot of people in Congress are afraid to get out front on this issue. And maybe there's strength in numbers. So maybe, you know, at the hearing Tuesday, enough of them will, um, you know, give each other courage so that they can ask some tough questions. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned uh, previously about the excessive secrecy that it's been going on for so long. And Adam Schiff, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, he, he was quoted as saying, one of the great mysteries of our time and to break the cycle of excessive secrecy and speculation with truth and transparency. Now, there's been a yeah. lot of discussion recently about this secrecy. Christopher Mellon's mentioned it a few times. So do you think Congress is aware of that and actually are trying to do something about it proactively? Right. Yeah, you'd have to be deaf, dumb and blind, you know, not to know what, what's gone on um, in the past. And, uh, um, you know, the history of this uh, issue, this phenomenon is really very shameful when you go back to it. I mean, the, yes. the misinformation, the disinformation going back uh, to the 50s, um, and, uh, you know, the, the government dismissed these as hallucinations, as illusions, fly specks on the windscreen, you know, marsh gas, um, all natural phenomena, reflections from the desert floor. You go back and, um, and all along the data was there. Um, and, and, and um, you know, uh, right after World War II, we had the most highly trained uh, military pilots in the world. And they were seeing these things. And you can't tell them that they were, they were seeing the planet Venus. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, so um, the, the, the data was there, but the government just, you know, covered it up and misled the American people. And it's, it, it really is a shameful um, period. And now I think we're, we've made a lot of progress. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, it's going to take a second to... Give a shout out to Lara. Thank you for the donation. Lara says, thank you, Mr. Blumenthal, for your dedication and persistence. And to Vinny as well. Thank you so much, Lara. That's very, very kind of you. Appreciate it. Um, where are we? And now that we've also learned that there's going to be closed hearings straight after the hearings, do you think that that is just where the sort of classified information will be discussed, sources well, it, and methods? And yeah, and it will like be. That? I mean, the committee has already said that there'll be a classified session after the public session. So, yeah, right away, that should make you a little uneasy. Like, what are they saying in the classified session that they can't say in the public session? And, I mean, that's always been the issue. As you know, the UAP report that came out last June, a nine-page report, some people thought it was too skimpy, um, but that was followed by a classified uh, report that was given to congressional committees. We don't really know what's in that. So there's, you know, we're always playing this game that Congress um, publicly is given this information, then privately they're given more information. So we don't know. Uh, we can speculate, but we don't know what's in that. And, you know, we've been very careful in our reporting to stick to what we can uh, attribute. Um, because, you know, on the, on the web, there's all kinds of rumors and stuff floating around. And we, we've been very careful in the New York Times to uh, focus on what we can attribute, what we can say we know is true and not and to speculate and not, you know, no heavy breathing that secret sources tell us this. And uh, I think that inspires um, skepticism. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of information out there, as you know, but to separate that from what and, you know, what, what has come out has been really very, very limited. I mean, uh, people always ask, well, who's behind these UFOs? Where do they come from? What do they want? Where are the aliens? And we we haven't dealt with any of that in our reporting because it's all speculative. We don't know what we do know is that they have been these objects are first of all they're real because the government has now admitted that for the first time in the report last june uh, these objects are not illusions they're not you know uh, um, some mystical you know, marsh gas or reflections where they you know, they're real physical objects but other than that nobody knows so but that that in itself is is, is progress yeah absolutely i mean one thing we did learn from the 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 briefing from last year, sorry, the uh, report from last year, John Greenwald of the Black Vault managed to get the heavily redacted version. And one thing we learned was that there was the, um, shapes. They were talking about the shapes of these things, but they felt the need to redact them, even though that doesn't give out the sort of sources and methods. So I think a lot of people were confused about that. What yeah, do you think? I, exactly. I think that there, there's absolutely much too, too much secrecy. Things like shapes. First of all, that's not a big secret. Uh, mm. Shapes have been talked about by people, you know, uh, ever since the beginning of the, you know, flying saucer era. 
the triangles, they're, you know, they're round, they're uh, cigar shaped, uh, tic tac shaped. Most recently, they've been described as. So, um, you know, why are they redacting that? Um, that? That seems to be, you know, overkill. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned earlier as well that these are the first hearings in over 50 years. There was, uh, what, I think, 66 and, and 68. Uh, I think in 66, the Air Force just put it off to things like swamp gas. And I think by 69, the Air Force had concluded that UFOs had no threat to national security, which obviously is simply not the case. Right. Do you think there's a chance we could see something similar with these hearings? Or do you think the door is well and truly open now that such levels of secrecy and obfuscation can't creep back in? Yeah, well, I think they can't say anymore that these things aren't real because they've already said they are real. So we have to move on from that. And, um, you know, there are a lot of questions about the data. For example, uh, some of the sightings by the, our veteran pilots like Dave Fravor have suggested that these things are operating transmedium in the water as well. They've been seen uh, entering the water or under the water, coming out of the water. I mean, that is an amazing question um, because... You know, we can almost understand uh, hypersonic objects in the atmosphere. We've been conditioned to, you know, to understand that, think of that. But underwater, I mean, you know, water is a very um, difficult medium to, uh, to, to operate in quickly, fast, <laughs> yeah. because of the water resistance. And if some objects can operate underwater as submarines have seen and as they've been eyeballed coming into and out of the water, well, that's sensational news. So... Um, I don't know how much of that might come out, the transmedium aspect. And of course, the question that we raised very um, uh, carefully in a limited way in the New York Times as, as to whether the government is in possession of any actual materials. Mm. Um, we, we reported in the Times that um, uh, the congressional committees were briefed with a series of slides, one of which we showed in the New York Times, on... Um, um, on possible recoveries of um, whatever you want to call it, anomalous material. Um, so that would be sensational. Um, and there have been a lot of stories over the years about that. Again, we stuck to what we could document in the New York Times. We didn't go um, into, into, you know, speculation. And there's a, a lot of crazy stuff floating around that may, may be true, but you can't prove it. Um, but what we do know is that congressional committees were briefed on uh, some possible material recoveries, and uh, and this this material was deemed to be non-earthly. In other words, it was not anything that um, that they could identify as products of of earthly technology. Um, so um, and you know and that brings up the question, which is often raised: Well, could these things be super secret U.S. technology or Russian or Chinese? And, uh, and that's trotted out periodically. It was in the report last June as a, as a possible explanation. Well, maybe it's, you know, Russian or Chinese, but, you know, they, they had to go through all the possibilities in this report. And then they pretty much rejected them one by one, um, that they were not natural phenomena. They weren't cloud formations. They weren't, uh, you know, thunder clouds. They weren't all these things. And they weren't Chinese and Russian because the technology is so superior to anything we know uh, on earth. Um, so we pretty much, you know, the people we've talked to at the times have discounted the possibility that this could be, um, uh, you know, technology of our adversaries. So what's left? I mean, you do the logic. Uh, there's no answer <laughs> except that, well, it ain't from, from earth. So, you know, go figure. Uh, just a quick message to everybody in the chat. I've only got Ralph for a very limited time, so I, will, I won't be able to get to all of your questions, but I did notice this one here, which I think is really good. Uh, Resi Tuba asks, does Ralph believe the provenance of these objects is known at least at a certain military level, or are the military as baffled as everyone else? I think they know more than they're saying. Uh, for example, um, uh, NASA uh, has obviously uh, you know, very sophisticated uh, surveillance uh, technology because they are they're in the space station and they're way up there so they can see if these objects are entering the atmosphere um we have uh, defense technology you know the norad system that uh, guards against the missile attacks so uh, you know have they seen these objects entering the atmosphere um those are those are really good questions and i think um 
uh, you know, I, I don't want to speculate on the answer, but I, I would say that it's probably more than has been put out publicly because there's a certain defense aspect to this. Everybody knows that. And the government doesn't always say everything it knows. Um, so to, to answer the question, I think they, they do know more than they're saying. Yeah, I think that was like one of the questions that uh, Christopher Mellon was uh he put out a list of questions on Twitter, and I think that was along those kind of lines as well. Um, but the thing as well is what I find strange is that AOI MSG, the group, is actually situated under OS, uh, OUSDI, which I think is limited in its scope, and it, it may not be able to meet the needs of Congress. So surely it would be better placed somewhere else. I don't know, ODNI or even Space Force. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't know where this thing could, could be. I mean, uh, it, it is tricky. First of all, uh, you know, uh, most of the most the sophisticated um, agencies we have, the surveillance, are military agencies. So mm. uh, ultimately under the Pentagon. And, you know, the problem they came across with the previous um, uh, agency ATIP, which is what we broke in the New York Times in 2017, that the Pentagon had actually a secret office that was monitoring, um, you know, UAP or UFOs, whatever they want to call it. Um, and the problem was that ATIP could not get uh, the top security clearance to to investigate, and um, uh, you know, not for lack of trying, but uh, you know, th this is th there's so much secrecy and so many levels of uh, super secret, uh, you know, uh, uh, classified uh, areas in the government that even an agency officially tasked in the Pentagon with um, investigating this phenomenon, couldn't get access to the special access groups uh, that is holding this information. So um, th that's, th that's the problem, that the information is very, very tightly held and um, penetrating this. Uh, the reason it's been secret for so long, for a reason, because uh, they've been very good at, at, at you know, um, uh, closing this off, smokestacking it or whatever you want to call it, that only certain people have access to this information. It's not shared widely in the government. Um, even presidents, uh, we've heard, uh, have not been able to penetrate this. You know, um, it's not something that is, is, is normally briefed back and forth to different agencies. So it's, it's very, very tightly held. Yeah, um, I'm just going to shout out Sneaky Toaster. Thank you for the five dollars. Uh, the question: Which do you put more stock in, or credibility in, or SAP or A tip? And do you think James Webb Telescope science discovery will be a key part to soften public backlash? Uh, well, OSAP and A tip. OSAP was the previous uh, agency, um, and A tip was the public name of it. They've played games with these names. You know that uh, some of the names are more public than other names. Um, and um, at the New York Times, we just kept calling it ATIP and, you know, uh, it, not to confuse readers that it went under different names. And um, but um, I think the, the Webb telescope is, an, is a real uh, potentially huge advance because that can if that pokes into space and sees these if these things are really interplanetary um, and come from from truly from outer space, they, they could or should be picked up somehow, somewhere. And these telescopes, I mean, they're now, you know, we just had the story uh, broken the other day about the black hole at the heart of the um, Milky Way galaxy. Um, and they took pick and they have images of another black hole 55 million light years away. So that's even further away. So if they can do that, um, maybe they can pick up these objects uh, traversing space. Um, so uh, that would be sensational. Now, would they release that if they have those images? Uh, you know, that, that's something that Congress could perhaps pry out. Yeah. Do you think this whole situation within the government, it helps that it's actually a bipartisan effort as well? Yeah. I mean, I think this is one thing that hopefully both parties in our very fractured democracy can agree on, that it'd be nice to get the answers to some of these questions. It's completely not. You don't. There's no Republican or Democratic answer to these questions. And, you know, in the old science fiction movies, the threat from outer space was always the thing that brought the world together. So um, that that is probably a, a very helpful aspect of this, that there is no certainly in this country, um, there's no partisan way to look at this issue. Nobody can get an advantage one way or the other. 
um, in, in, in hiding or putting out this information. So everybody has an interest. And most of all, the American people have an interest in knowing this stuff because it's our future, you know, and um, uh, we, we need to know what the potential is for what the, the questions that are raised are the most fundamental questions um, in the history of humanity. Are we alone? What else is out there? Uh, what, you know, how did creation start? Um, you can't get b bigger questions than that. Yeah, absolutely. And now since the announcement of the hearings, you know, I've been updating all my social medias with, with all the, the news as it comes in and things. But I've seen an awful lot of people commenting things like the government will never tell us anything. It's just deflection tactics. It's another nothing burger. What sort of response would you give to those kind of comments? No, I don't believe that. I think progress comes. I think we've made progress. I think it's very easy to be uh, cynical. Um, mm. It's also easy to be overly uh, optimistic and say, this is the beginning of disclosure. This is, you know, <laughs> when we did our reporting, Leslie and I and Helene Cooper in the beginning, um, one of the things we heard was, oh, this is part of a careful plan to feed out limited information. You know, there are always people who have a conspiratorial bent and they will tell you that this is all part of a conspiracy to do this or that. I've been reporting long enough to know that it's very hard to maintain a, consp a real conspiracy. Um, so I don't believe that um, this was trotted out at this particular time for a particular reason. I think we did some really good reporting. Um, we had some good luck. We had some good sources. We got the story out. It was not fed to us. I can tell you that. Uh, it was, you know, nobody uh, put this out in the New York Times for any ulterior motive that, that we could ever uh, discern. We we dug it out because we talked to the right people. Um, and by the same token, um, I don't think it's it's wise or accurate to downplay it and say, ah, oh, this is just all, you know, window dressing. It's nonsense. Um because there's too many moving parts here. I mean, there are people involved in the secrecy, uh, some of whom I've spoken to, who would like to see the, the veil lifted and more information mm -hmm. out, not everything, but a good part of it. Um, there's struggles going on behind the scenes. It's a complicated business and there's no one orchestrating it to the point of you know, uh, hand feeding out the information or clamping down on the information saying this can't come out. I think that they will try to be careful in the hearings they being, you know, the government, uh, Bray and Moultrie, the two star witnesses. Um, I don't think they're going to, you know, spill their guts. Um, sure. uh, but I think they'll be careful. I think uh, th there will be a lot of thought beforehand on what they could say, should say in response to questions. After all, there are some security aspects involved here. You know, how much we know, we, the government, knows about this phenomenon, what we don't want our adversaries to know, what we think our adversaries are doing. They're doing the same thing, by the way. The yeah. Russians and Chinese, from everything we know, are also investigating. And they're trying to reverse engineer this phenomenon, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we are competing. So not, not everything is going to be laid out in the public record. I understand that. So, um, but I, I don't think that we should be cynical and say, oh, this is just window dressing. This is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I kind of understand the cynicism because it's been so long that we, this has been hidden from us. But at the same time, for me personally, I do feel like there's a bit of a change at the moment, a little, maybe I wouldn't go as far as saying a paradigm shift, but it feels like something's a little bit different in this day and age. Do, what, yeah, how do you feel yeah, about that kind of thing? Yeah, A lot has come out. I mean, a lot, some has come out. And as I said, the, UAP reporter last June, almost a year ago, when they said, you know, we looked at all the phenomena, they said all but one um, of the 140 some odd cases that they featured in this report uh, remain a mystery. So that's a far cry from, you know, what the Air Force said that, oh, the, this was all explained in Blue Book, um, even though there were 700, 701 cases left on the table that were not explained. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't feature that. But they said, oh, no, this has been, you know, explained away. And uh, this is all ridiculous. Nothing to see here, folks. You know, just move on. So um, and now th this UAP report said that uh, all but uh, one of the 140 some odd cases uh, remain unexplained. So mm -hmm. that's that's a lot of progress. And um, I think there's a, a greater willingness willingness now. And the reporting that we and others have done, I think, have helped push that door open.
Yeah, absolutely. And will the New York Times have a presence at the hearings for reporting it as they happen? I'm sure they will. I mean, uh, they cover Congress. Uh, they will probably cover it with their own people out of the Washington Bureau. But um, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, th this is not the kind of thing that uh, will pass unnoticed. And you won't be going yourself then? I will not be going uh, no. because, they, you know, we have a big bureau there. I'm, I'm a contributor to the Times now. I was on the staff for many years, but now I'm um, not on the staff anymore. So uh, when I come up with a good story, like with Leslie, uh, um, we, we, you know, we've had a chance to break that story as outsiders in The New York Times as contributors. So I think they'll probably handle that in-house. Excellent. I look forward to seeing some more coverage and hopefully, you know, for the weeks following. Um, have, you, have you got anything in the works that you can talk about at all? Well, you know, Leslie and I continue to talk to sources. We, we, we're, you know, we, we have a lot of things pending and information requests out there. Um, and when we feel we have enough pulled together, we'll try to break it in The New York Times. Uh, we're certainly not at the end. You know, we haven't answered all the questions. Um, there's a lot of, you know, cases out there that are interesting. They come up all the time um, and we hear about them, um, but we don't write everything we, we hear about till we, you know, nail it down. So, um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the hearing may open, so open up some new doors. I mean, it may give c uh, courage and confidence to people, whistleblowers and uh, people in Congress and in the Pentagon who have information. Clearly, there's more information than has come out so far. Um, we'd like to hear some of that and uh, see if we could, um, yeah, we're definitely going to keep up our reporting. Excellent. Now, for somebody that's written and studied the, the work of John Mack so much, dare I ask what you think he might think of what's happening at the moment? Well, I think he'd be very encouraged. You know, he was very uh, uh, courageous uh, as a Harvard psychiatrist who heard from his uh, patients and people who sought him out that they had these encounters with alien beings. And um, it was even more ridicule provoking then than it is today, because now it's become sort of part of the culture, but it was more sensational then. And yet um, he resolved to, to try to get to the bottom of it. And uh, he, he paid a big price. Harvard put him under investigation. Uh, he suffered a, <coughs> me, a lot of ridicule. But um, as I say in my book, The Believer, um, he, uh, he went about it in a, in a very rigorous way. Uh, he, he in a book he wrote, he focused on 13 case studies. He um, interviewed the people extensively, talked about their background, their history, their psychiatric history, and he found that there was nothing in their history to suggest that they were uh, deluded or crazy uh, or, or that they had anything to gain from telling these stories. On the contrary, they were ashamed. of They couldn't understand what had happened. They said to him, please tell me I'm crazy. And he said, no, you're not crazy, but you have had some kind of experience that we cannot explain. And there were so many of these stories and, and so similar in a way. And they occurred to uh, men and women, old, young, professionals, blue collar, even children as young as two who t told stories about being taken up in the in the in the sky, you know, by little beings. And these children have not read books or seen movies about aliens. They didn't know, you know, they, they just uh, so that all added to the mystery. And Mac pursued it. He didn't come up with the answer. But the people who claim there's an answer, like, oh, it's, you know, sleep paralysis, it's, it's this, it's, oh, the, you know, hyp the hypnosis planted these stories. None of that checks out. None of that checks out. So the so-called skeptics, I wish they'd spend a little more time studying the, the literature and the stories because it remains a, a, a deep, profound mystery. We don't know, but we know at least what it's not. And it's not all the things that, you know, a lot of people think they they know. It's not mental illness. It's not, you know, natural phenomena, mis, misunderstood. So what it is, we don't know. Yeah. I highly recommend everybody go out and check out Ralph's book, The Believer. I think it's available on Amazon and all, all the kind of regular outlets. Um, so my final question, Ralph, is do you have any plans to write another book? <laughs> you know, this took a lot out of me. This was seven <laughs> years I started this when Mac was run over in London. Yeah. Um, a lot of people had conspiracy theories 
he had gone to London for a conference on uh, Lawrence of Arabia. He wrote a Pulitzer, won a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, his biography of, uh, of T.E. Lawrence um, was spectacular. It was a psychological uh, um, you know, biography of one of the most enigmatic figures in, in history. Um, and, um, and he went to London 30 years later for a conference after the book had come out and he was run over, looked the wrong way, which happens in your country. It does. <laughs> we, we Yanks <laughs> go over there and look the wrong way. And um, it was a guy who had had too much to drink, as I point out in my book. And, um, um, and that's when I started my research. And that was, you know, 17 years ago. And it's been I got access to all his papers from his family and um, stuff that had never come out, his un unpublished articles and his his own therapy sessions, by the way, as a psychiatrist, he had to go into um, therapy himself with a therapist. So we know what was going on in his mind. He wasn't crazy either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was just curious. So anyway, um, so I haven't figured out my next... Um, uh, project yet, but I've done some articles in the New York Times on other things, so I'm yeah. always looking around. Excellent. Well, Ralph, we've just got over the half an hour mark. I cannot thank you enough for agreeing to come and talk to me today. Um, for everybody watching, um, the congressional hearings are, are going to be streamed live on YouTube, but I'm going to be joining a group of friends over on Witness Citizen Sean's channel uh, as they happen. We're going to watch along and discuss anything that's said, so come and check that out if you want. But for now, everyone, again, thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everyone, for watching live. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Many Take thank care, you. Everyone. Always a pleasure. Thank okay. you, Ralph. Anytime. Bye. Cheerio. Bye-bye.